Uh, I want you right now, turn to your other neighbor, your second choice, and tell that person, power up. Power up. You know, if you want to train for strength building, you want to build your strength physically, it's not exactly rocket surgery. Some of y'all get that on the way home. It's, it's really very simple. You fuel your body with clean, whole foods, and then you train for strength. You do muscular training, you do aerobic training, you do flexibility training, and then you rest and recover and repeat. It's, it's very straightforward. Now, I think we would all agree, or at least the vast majority of us would agree, that doesn't mean it's easy. Just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. I mean, our, our natural distaste for discomfort can degenerate into delays and excuses and keep us from doing it. And it, it, man, it is hard to make that time to make yourself uncomfortable. But what happens when we train for strength, the way God has built our bodies, the, gene, the creative genius of God means that the muscle fibers that we exercise in any kind of resistance or weight training, the muscle fibers are temporarily broken down and made weaker, but again, in God's creative genius, they come back healthier and stronger than they were before if we're fueling our bodies properly, resting and recovering. That is physical strength training. Spiritual strength training works exactly the same way. In the same way that God wired our bodies up to need resistance training, our spirit, our souls, our hearts and our minds also need resistance training. Now, some people might say, well, I'm, I'm strength training spiritually right now. I'm at church. And, and that's, that's cool. That's great. But that's not really strength training. Actually, what this would be would be more like going to the training table. This is where we are taking in, we are ingesting and processing and metabolizing spiritually the Word of God and this time together that we have with each other. Think about this. Everybody, take a look around the room just real quick. Can we raise the lights for just a second? Just bring the lights up and everybody look around the room and, and kind of crane your neck and look to some place that you're not used to looking. First of all, look at God's sense of humor. There's, there's some funny people in this room. I don't mean funny looking. I mean funny people. Your presence is an encouragement to everybody in the room. Your presence in the room matters. And it's an encouragement. It feeds the fire of faith and faithfulness. But it's not really strength training per se. We are actually at the training table. Where strength training actually happens is out on the rugged plains of reality, out where you live and I live. As we travel and traverse the ups and the downs, the twists and the turns of this journey that God has given to us, that's where we build strength. That's where we develop the muscle memory of faith and develop our spirit. And in the same way that physical strength training requires resistance, so does spiritual strength training. You have to encounter resistance to grow spiritually, to mature. Today, as we continue this series strong enough, that's examining the life of Joshua. We're looking at the life of Joshua for the biblical record of his life, but also the principles and the practices that God has supernaturally embedded in Scripture to help us understand how to be strong enough for this life he has created us, he has called, he has commissioned us to live. And in the life of Joshua, it is a fascinating process to study. Now, I, I've, I was one of those kids that was a cradle Christian. I, I, I was born into the church. I wasn't born a Christian. Nobody's born a Christian. But I grew up in the church. I knew the stories about you know, Abraham and Sarah and Moses and Joshua and David and on and on and on and on. But I learned something so profound as I was studying and examining the life of Joshua. God was always, always preparing Joshua for the, the ultimate 
job that he would hold. His ultimate calling as a person would be to succeed Moses, to follow in the sandal prints of Moses as the leader of Israel. But his entire life was a case study in strength building, in developing the spiritual muscle memory that he would need when that moment arrived. I want you to go with me to Exodus chapter number 33. In Exodus 33, the Bible records a moment when Joshua is fairly young in his life, in his career. This is what the Bible says, Exodus 33, verse 11. Now the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Can we take a time out on that for just a second? Think about that. Moses, a human being just like you and me, met and spoke with God face to face. Now, at some point, all of us will meet God face to face. But this happened on a regular basis while Moses was still living on earth. The Bible says that never happened for anybody else. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, the son of Nun, or Nun, did not leave the tent. I want you to turn to your first neighbor, your, your first best friend here this morning, and look at him and mean it with your heart and smile, but tell him, don't leave the tent. Y'all, that was terrible. That was awful. 915 is not quite as large as this crowd, and they smoked y'all. I tell you what, let's say it positively, shall we? Stay in the tent. Tell your neighbors, stay in the tent. Stay in the tent. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Now, the tent that is referenced here in Exodus 33, the tent is the tent of meeting. This is where Moses would commune and connect and converse with God. He would receive instructions from God here and then return to the camp and give Israel the instructions to be implemented. But meanwhile, Joshua stayed in the tent. Joshua at this point in his life is like Moses' kind of aide de camp. He is, he is he's basically an intern at this point. And he's functioning in a role that very, very few people even know about. Very few people in Israel would have known his name. Moses obviously knew who he was. But Moses would meet with God and then go to the people. Moses was the household name in Israel. But Joshua stayed in the tent. He, he stayed in the shadows where there was nobody around, nobody celebrating him, nobody telling him, good job. He just stayed faithful and stayed on the task. But you see here the beginnings of this strength building process. And, and, and here's the bottom line. Here, here's the, the moment from Joshua's life that applies where we live. Every experience, every experience, God uses every experience of your life and my life to prepare us for what he has prepared for us. God uses every experience to prepare us, everything good, bad, ugly, and undecided, all of it in God's economy can be used to prepare us for what he has prepared for us. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves me. So I want you to just kind of, for a moment, just kind of rewind and replay the life, your life so far. Everything that's brought you to this moment right here, just kind of hit like a, a Netflix review. Go all the way back and all the way forward and just know that in God's economy, everything, say everything, everything, everything could be used to prepare you, to prepare me for what God has prepared for us. We, we see this happen throughout the Bible. It's not just Joshua, as a matter of fact, in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians 2 says that for everyone who follows Christ, this is post-resurrection. This is in the wake of the cross. Here's what the Bible says, Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, okay, you've done a little rewind. Let's do a little fast forward for a second. Let's, let's tell you what, let's do this, just to keep it simple for me. Let's say that next Sunday, you bring somebody with you to church and you're praying for them all week. You're praying that God leads them to Christ. You're praying they respond to his grace initiative and you, you do the work. That, that would be, that would, I think we would all agree that would qualify as a good work. If, let me, and let me just tell you this. If you do that, if you do that, God will mess you up. It will change everything about your walk with Christ. It'll change everything about how you view the church, how you view Sunday worship. It, it, will, it will open up a vein of growth and maturity and compassion that you didn't even know existed. I'm just telling you that as a little warning. So buckle up. But if you do it, that's a good work that God had already prepared for you before you ever drew a breath, before you ever got out of bed. God had already prepared that, and he has used every part of your life to prepare you for what he has already prepared for you in Christ, in Christ. And that's what we see happening in the life of Joshua. Now, going back to Joshua's life, there's a moment that's recorded for us in Exodus chapter 17. And in Exodus 17, this is the first time we encounter Joshua in Scripture. In Exodus 17, <clears throat> Israel has just, just escaped over 430 years of Egyptian slavery. They have just made their way out of Egypt. They're working their way north. They're in the Sinai Desert. It's where Moses would ultimately receive the Ten Commandments from God. But they are out of Egyptian slavery, and man, they are looking toward the promised land. They're looking toward the fulfillment of the promise that God had made over 500 years before to Abraham when he told him he would make of him and Sarah a great nation. This is that moment. And Israel's kind of chomping at the bit. They're like, here we go, man, this is it. They get out of Egyptian slavery, and look at what happens in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 10. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. This is the same staff of God that Moses had used in Egypt to usher in the 10 plagues that led Egypt to please beg Israel to leave. This was the same staff that he raised part of the water, waters of the, of the Jordan River that, or the Red Sea that allowed Israel to cross through on dry land as Pharaoh's army pursued them. This was that staff. Verse 10, so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. So again, you see this moment in Joshua's life where Israel is literally fighting for their life. This is, a, this is a battle with life and death consequences for God's people. And who does Moses choose but Joshua to entrust the security, the military leadership of this fledgling nation called Israel? But it's interesting because Joshua, while he was on the battlefield, the Bible says that Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the hilltop to have a, a vantage point. And then there, there's a whole other sermon in that. But is it, can, can't you imagine, let's say that Joshua is roughly 20 years old or so, 22. He's fresh out of college. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur go up to the hill, but Moses says, you're going down to the battlefield. You're going to be fighting for your life, making life and death decisions for your soldiers. Joshua does not say, but I want to go up to the hill. How come Aaron and Hur get to go up there with you? He didn't do that. He did exactly what the man of God told him to do. He did as Moses ordered. But now watch, watch how God uses this moment. Look at verse 13. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely 
blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. What you see Joshua doing here is building strength for faithfulness. You see, one of the reasons that we build strength spiritually is for faithfulness. Isn't it fascinating that God told Moses, I want you to write this down. I want you to record this W. They're in the locker room after the game, after the battle. Everybody's clapping. God says, write it down. I want you to record this win and make sure that Joshua hears it. I want, I want Joshua to always remember my faithfulness so that will build strength for his faithfulness. You see, every time we recognize, every time we record, every time we remember God's faithfulness, that feeds the fire of our faithfulness. And, and it's not always easy to see in the moment. Can't you imagine when Joshua's in the middle of this battle, literally fighting for his life and the life of Israel, in that moment, he's not thinking, man, I wonder how God's going to use this. You see, a lot of times when we're in the middle of a battle, why is the wrong question. I understand the why. I'm a why guy. I want to know why as well. But I want you to play this out with me. Let's just say for the sake of conversation that you were given a why that sufficed. You were given a why that satisfied your curiosity. And it was, it was God's reason why. In that moment of the battle, of the struggle, of the grief, of the hurt, of the mourning, whatever it might be, it doesn't matter. It's, it's not enough when I'm hurting to convince me that it's worth it. It's only with the value of hindsight looking back that we see God's faithfulness. I remember when, when my parents got divorced, I was 12 years old. That was not God's will. And this was, this was so out of the blue in our household. I mean, my mom and dad were not like always fighting tooth and nail, and this was just the final straw. We were just waiting for it to happen. For us, my brothers and me as, as kids, it was out of the blue. It was out. We had no idea it was coming. And I remember when my dad said he was going to leave, and we were like, what? I mean, we were in church every single Sunday. My dad was a deacon. My parents, man, they walked in church holding hands. What do you mean you're leaving? And in that moment, I remember being so disoriented, so discombobulated. I was like, what? What is happening? Our family... And we were like the cleavers. Remember Leave it to Beaver? It was Ward and June. My mom didn't vacuum in pearls, but it was close. <laughs> and so when my dad left, I, just, I was at a loss. But now? Now, after 45 years of following Christ, after 45 years of his faithfulness, now I can look back and say, it still wasn't God's will, but even something outside of his will, in his sovereign power, he was able to use for his glory and our good. My brothers and I all, my mom and I, all of us would tell you, it wasn't God's will, but it was for his glory and our good. I've seen over and over and over and over how God's used that. And that's just one example. When we record and we remember God's faithfulness, it feeds the fire of our faithfulness. Now, I want to point something out that is a little bit of an aside. This, this is a little bit of a distraction, but it comes up here, and this is actually a great place to address it. You'll notice here it says that Joshua overcame the Amalekites with the sword. And God said, I will erase the memory of Amalek. And it raises the question, how could a loving God commission war and killing? That's a great question. And I completely respect where it comes from. I know it, it but it's a great question. People say, well, listen, Jesus, I'm all about that. Forgiveness, grace, oh, amen. You preach that, brother. But bro, when I read the Old Testament, there is a lot of bloodshed. What is up with that? Well, here is, I think, a sound 
theological answer that makes sense of it. The people that God commanded Israel to kill, to conquer, they had become so corrupt, so depraved, so degenerate in their idolatry, in their witchcraft, in their sacrifice of children, that God had given them over to their sin. He had removed his hand of restraint from them, and there was no return for them. So they were subject to his judgment. And so you have here an intersection of history and the will of God, the purposes of God through his people, Israel. And this is nothing new. Romans chapter one tells us that there are people in the New Testament era, people in our era, who have so rejected God, who have so suppressed the truth that God gives them over to their desires, the Bible says. And when that happens, that is God's call. So there are three things to remember about God. Anytime you see that or somebody asks you the question, here's what you remember. Number one, God is holy. Say holy. holy. He's holy. That means he is morally perfect. He never errs ethically. He never makes a mistake in his choices. He is holy, pure, and perfect. Number two, God is always just. He is just. So that means that anytime God brings judgment, his judgment is always just. It is always, say always, always. fair. You and I have to worry about whether or not we're being fair. How many of you are the oldest child in your family of origin? Can I see a show of hands like me? You're the oldest? How many times as the oldest did we say to our parents, well, that's not fair. Remember? Remember? That's not fair. I've got a really good friend who used to tell his kids, you know what fair is? Fair is what you pay to ride the bus. The world is not fair, but God is always fair fair. He is always just. So when he issues a judgment, you can know that he is just. And number three, he is good. He is always good. So he is holy, he is just, and he is good. For a human being to look at anything that God might do or judgment he might render and say something to the effect of, well, I can't believe in a God who would do that, or I won't believe, I don't believe God is like, that, that statement requires a level of hubris and arrogance that I don't think any of us would aspire to. To impose my morality on God? That's, that's insane. That's like me going, hey, Michael Jordan, you just, I mean, you're good. You, you're, you're fine. But I want to help you elevate your game. That's, Michael would look at me and go, bruh, that's so cute. Have a nice day. God is holy, he is just, and he is good. Always, no variance, no days off. So when he judges, like he judged the Amalekites, like he would judge others, it is always the right answer. It is always holy, just, and good. Joshua's building strength for faithfulness. Now, Numbers chapter 14, Moses has sent into the promised land 12 spies, a reconnaissance mission, to go into the promised land and scope it out. I want to know the lay of the land. I want to know what the people are like. I want to know what the farming is like. I want to know everything that we can know about it because these people are not going to just turn around and roll out the red carpet and let us in. We're going to have to fight for the promises of God. And so he sends 12 spies in, and all 12 come back. And of the 12, Joshua and Caleb were like, this place is unbelievable. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The, the bunches of grapes were so big, we had to have two men carry them out. You would not believe it. Man, let's go, Mo. But 10 spies come back. 10 of the 12 come back, and they're like, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. it's a hard no for me, dog. We, no, 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 no. It's, it's a nice place, but these people are giants. We are like grasshoppers in their eyes, the Bible says. 
they said. And they said, don't do it, don't do it. But it's in this moment that you see Joshua and his fellow spy, Caleb, stand up. And, and they are building strength for something else. Look at what the Bible says. Numbers chapter 14, verses 6 through 9. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes. They were in mourning. They grieved the faithlessness of their fellow spies. And they said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Two guys. Now, the Bible doesn't record where Moses was on this, but two of the spies. And then the entire nation of Israel, probably about two million people, scholars estimate, were all saying, don't go. They were saying, don't go to the point that the Bible says in the next verse that the entire assembly of Israel, the whole nation, began openly discussing stoning Joshua and Caleb. That means throwing rocks at them until they are dead. You ever face any opposition? You ever have somebody come against you, tell you, that's a bad idea, we should not do that. I, I, no, I don't, God doesn't want you to do that. Don't, don't, uh, you, you must be crazy. Let me tell you something, if you chase God hard enough and long enough, you will face fights. And Joshua is building strength for fights. He's built, a, he's built strength for faithfulness. Here you see him building strength for a fight. He'd already had a ringside seat for every fight Moses had ever fought. And it's interesting, in Moses' ministry, in his career as the leader of Israel, most of Moses' fights were with the Israelite people themselves. I mean, there are multiple times that you see God, you see Moses crying out to God, asking him for relief from the position of leadership God had called him. He goes, God, these people are wearing me out. They grumble about everything. You gave us manna in the wilderness and quail, quail, bacon wrapped, qu I'm just kidding, it wasn't bacon wrapped because they were Jewish, but <laughs> quail, and they complained. Joshua had a ringside seat for every one of those fights. So he's building strength for the fight. Listen, as a follower of Christ, you must, I must be willing to fight for our faith. Now, we don't go looking for fights. We're not going to be ugly and rude or a jerk to people. We don't post stuff online to stir people up. That's what the world does. That's what Fox News, CNN, MSN, that's what they want you to do. We don't act like that. Tell your neighbor, I don't act like that. And if you do, don't tell anybody you go to church here. <laughs> but you must build strength for fights. And part of the strength that God gives us is our friends. Who's your Caleb? Who's your Caleb? Who stands with you when the whole world tells you you're nuts? That's your Caleb. That's, that's somebody who comes alongside you. That's why we pour so much time and energy and money and prayer into our student ministry, into our children's ministry, so that kids develop friendships, students develop relationships of Caleb and Joshua, people that will stand with them when the chips are down. That's why we pour so much into our Bible studies and our groups. This is great, but you can come in here and be anonymous. This is important, but this is not connecting. You don't, you don't walk into a church service and walk out and know a Caleb or have a Caleb. You get that with people you do life with, and it's with them, through them, that God builds that strength for the fight that you're going to need, Jack, Jackie. You're going to have to have it. It's not an option. And if you're not fighting at some point, may I suggest 
you're not trying hard enough. You're not, you're not building enough strength. You're, you're just taking in, take, 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 eat, 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 eat. What happens if you stay at the training table and never go train physically? We cannot become spiritually obese Christians. We cannot become people who just eat, 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 podcast, podcast, sermon, 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 podcast, little, 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 without putting it to work, without using that which God has given to us. So we build strength for faithfulness. We build strength for fights. Now, now is Joshua's moment. The moment that he's most known for to assume command of Israel. Moses knows he's about to die. Moses knows his time as leader of Israel is about to expire. And look at how Moses prays. This is Numbers chapter 27, verse 15. Moses said to the Lord, may the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, worship. Moses says, you're God, I'm not. You give breath to everything. Would you appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them? One who will lead them out and bring them in so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. And so the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. What a leadership moment. What what an incredible, you know, leadership is just the world's version of what the church calls discipleship. Discipleship is leadership. Biblical leadership is, is discipleship. Moses knows his time is up and he's not praying, God, help these people to remember me fondly. Lord, I would love to see a monument to Moses at some place in the promise. He didn't say that. He says, God, I'm concerned about the people. I I want what you want for them. Give them a leader who will guide them, who will direct them. And so again, every part of Joshua's life has been preparing him for what God has prepared for him. This is that moment. The strength building for faithfulness, the strength building for the fights is for this moment to build strength for influence. You you build strength to influence other people, to, to be a blessing in their lives, to help them reach everything God has for them. It's one thing to be faithful in yourself and and by yourself when nobody's looking. That's important. It's another thing to be faithful and have the strength for the fight. But when you do both of those, God will then expand your influence. Your influence. Where are you making a difference? Whose life are you touching on a regular basis in a way that glorifies God and points them toward him and not towards you? Man, how badly does our world, how badly does our nation need leaders like that? That's my prayer. I'm not giving up hope. One day, it ain't this year, but one day, one day. But we build strength for influence. Remember the verse that I read in Ephesians? I want to just highlight something that it says there that I think is a great place to wrap this up. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Created in Christ Jesus. We are all created by Christ. 
The Bible says that Christ is the agent of creation. But created in Christ Jesus means that someone has chosen to follow Christ. That, that a person has chosen to respond to his grace initiative. Just before that, it says that the whole thing happens because of grace. His grace, not mine, not yours. His grace, so that nobody can brag or boast about anything they've done because it's all him. But when you realize that, when you respond to that, you are created in Christ Jesus. You are a new creation. That's the promise of Christ. If you're here today and you have never taken that step, in just a second, we want to give you the opportunity to do that. To respond to him and choose to follow him. Again, it's not a transaction. It's a relationship that he initiates, he sustains, and he perpetuates eternally. If you'd like to step into that, then you just pray. I'm going to ask everyone if you will bow your heads for a moment. And in this moment, just to pray, if that's you, that God is leading into a relationship with Christ, then you pray silently right where you are, just something like this. Just say, Jesus, I need you. That's right, just silently. It's, it's relationship, so you're communicating. Jesus, I need you. And so I confess my sin to you. I confess my sin so that I can receive your grace and forgiveness so that I can repent and change and begin to follow you. I give you all of my life and I will follow you from this moment. And I pray this prayer in your name. If you would just remain with your heads bowed for another moment. If that was your prayer, then this is the biggest moment of your life. And as a church, we want to help with the moments that follow, with what comes next. And so when we dismiss in just a moment, if that was your prayer today, we've got a gift that we would love to give you. It's just a, it's a Bible and a reading plan to help you begin this journey, begin this walk in this strength building process. When we leave here, you can just go out into the lobby that's out to your right from where you're sitting right now. There's a welcome area there in the corner. And all you got to do is just tell somebody there, say, hey, today was my day and they'll give it to you. And just very briefly, as our heads are bowed for another moment, if that was your prayer, would you raise your hand? Just raise your hand and hold it up high in the air for a moment. And understand that your hand matters because the Bible says all of heaven celebrates because of what just happened in your life. Isn't that amazing? So if it matters in heaven, it matters to us. And we celebrate like this. As you put your hands down, we're going to put our hands together and just tell you, welcome home. Welcome home. <laughs>